Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining me for this week's edition of the SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup. Today is Wednesday, October 6th, 2021, and today we're going to be looking at three questions we've been hearing from international admissions recruiters, enrollment planners, managers over the last few days. So stick with us over the next half hour and we'll get into three important questions that will help you in your international admissions work. First up today, we're going to cover the question, what will make or break strategic plans? We'll then talk about will test optional impact graduate admissions. And finally, we'll look at the third topic of the week, can internationalization be mandated by governments? And we'll look at those three topics and more this week on the Midweek Roundup for October 6, 2021. For those not uh, familiar with the Midweek Roundup, welcome to the family. Uh, we're really glad to have you part of the community as uh, we come to you either live on our Facebook page for SMIE Consulting or on repeat either on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page or for those who prefer podcasts, uh, our audio version of this Midweek Roundup is available as well on all major podcast providers. So thanks for making us a part of your weekly international edification. Uh, what we do each day, each week is on Wednesday, we'll take three themes we've seen develop over the last week or more in our news stories that we cover. Uh, we cover. We put out a newsletter every Monday called All the SMIE News Fit to Share. And if you're wondering, SMIE stands for Social Media and International Education. And that's how I built the consulting business around that, uh, those two major areas. And those news stories come out Monday, 9 a.m. Eastern in that newsletter I put out. And then we take those themes and go more in-depth on this Wednesday midweek roundup. So uh, I'm dropping the link to the most recent edition of the, of the newsletter in the comment section on the Facebook page. But if you want to subscribe to or check out past editions, you can go to smieconsulting.org slash subscribe, and you'll be able to uh, subscribe on a quick form and get, uh, get the newsletter in your inbox every Monday morning. So let's get right into that first question of the day. What will make or break strategic plans? And there's a couple articles that came out this past week uh, from the Chronicle, Chronicle of Higher Education, that really got to the heart of, I think, a lot of the challenges that go into putting together a strategic plan for an institution, and particularly ones that, uh, from my, my experience, and we'll boil this down to an international one as well, where international strategic plans can often fall, fall short of achieving objectives. And they are very, very similar, obviously higher education uh, in the business world, strategic plans have very similar uh, challenges, but we'll, we'll focus on what, uh, what makes or breaks uh, the strategic plan as it impacts international education on campus. And these two articles don't, again, don't speak specifically to uh, those challenges within international, but the themes I think are very, very applicable having done strategic planning uh, on international and uh, uh, campus-wide uh, initiatives over the past uh, 28 years on different campuses or either from, either from being on, that on the international admissions side myself or working on a campus or from a consulting perspective. And what I, I want to highlight from a couple of the, both of these articles are uh, things that make, that certainly rang true for me. Uh, and th these are some of the common complaints the first article uh, makes, uh, makes, it, makes, uh, makes it clear. Uh, some of the biggest complaints, despite good intentions, the process often ended up disorganized. Uh, second, too many committees were created and each of them had too many members. Well, with, the, with the goal of trying to be more inclusive than that, I suppose. Instead of being a tool to set priorities, the strategic plan turned into a checklist of everybody's hopes, dreams, and delusions, <laughs> often with internal contradictions. Yeah, I've seen that do, definitely as well. Uh, and then a year or two after a splashy kickoff, most people on campus lost interest in the plan and paid no attention to it. Well, that's uh, part of the human condition, I would think, uh, having... Uh, Having uh, clearly uh, short attention spans or increasingly short attention spans in our in our work, uh, when it was time for the plan to wrap up, the ending proved anticlimactic, 
with only administrators and marketing departments feeling any sense of accomplishment or closure, probably because they're the ones that probably were the most invested in uh, the planning and, uh, and implementation. So that certainly uh, it rings true from, from my experiences. I've been parts of uh, strategic plans that were very much, um, ha uh, and if it's institutional, it has to be a top-down thing uh, to be uh, to have any chance of success. I've seen individual departments uh, have their own strategic plans. Uh, certainly, many uh, international offices I've worked in had their own versions of strategic plans. And the goal, I think, in any of these developments of um, long-term planning for an office, for a campus, is the, the need for effective communication throughout the process, for perspective, uh, uh, for perspective members of the university community that are going to be engaged in the work of the planning, and oftentimes these are the committees that uh, this, this article references. Oftentimes it's the, uh, the, the thinkers get around the table, uh, but often don't uh, have the grand ideas, but don't often include kind of the worker bees, the people who will be on the ground that really need to uh, where, put those plans in action. Uh, many times these plans don't have strong, particularly institution-wide plans, don't have strong engagement from the faculty level, um, and which can often prove to be a major stumbling block in driving a plan uh, forward. Uh, and having acceptance of plans uh, from not just the top and top down, uh, from the highest levels of an administration that can have that time bandwidth to, to do these big thinking uh, exercises that, and hopefully develop some uh, framework for uh, implementation and success down the road. But there's always going to be challenges in that mix. So this first article, I should mention, by David uh, Permutter is, uh, is, is, is very close. It's an older article, but it was referenced uh, in this uh, last couple of weeks. And I think it's, it talks about the, some of the, some of, and it's written in the book about this process, uh, about the number of committees that should be formed, methods to use to get the pulse of a campus uh, in terms of are they really uh, think this is a need or uh, that uh, lessons from past strategic plans, gathering input, all these wonderful things. So I think that uh, it does lay out some of the important pieces of the puzzle. Uh, and I think uh, what, it, what it does really... Uh, really uh, reveal uh, as part of university processes. Uh, it's the experiences of those that are on these committees that are oftentimes the driving force and or the implementers on uh, subcommittees of the larger steering committee, if you will, uh, for strategic planning. Those folks who have, uh, for example, uh, been working with our, our, our campus that has really, for the first time in, uh, from the top level down, has embraced the idea of internationalization and what that means and developing a campus strategic plan from the top around this theme, uh, building on successes they've had at, at the institution and other areas related to diversification. You now see this campus um, in a very short order of time, uh, within one or two months of uh, kind of a launching this uh, process uh, with the steering committee, uh, really put the hard yards in in developing a strategic plan uh, that uh, a 10-year strategic plan with a lot of broad strokes and implementation is always the, the real rub of any of these plans. Uh, and that's what we're in the midst of doing with them is, is, is figuring out how to make this work on campus. Uh, is, is making sure, do we have all the right people around the table that need to be part of that conversation? Or do we want someone that we know might be um, um, a potential threat to uh, successful implementation of a plan because of their, uh, what they've said in the past about uh, certain things that might be in the works uh, to make, us, make the institution move in a certain direction? Do we need to include those faculty uh, or, or representatives of the faculty in the process on the steering committee? Because so often times the, big, the leadership might have the great uh, ideas and the, and the drive and the willingness to move things forward on a campus level. And you might have the buy-in of uh, many of the deans, but they'll be the first to tell you that if those deans, if those, their faculty aren't happy with uh, the way this is developing, or they can't sell the plan effectively to the faculty uh, in their departments, uh, then that can be a big roadblock to the 
uh, certainly the curricular side of uh, of internationalization, but also the willingness to bring more uh, students in from overseas uh, for, for, to help internationalize the campus. So there's a lot of different variables that you need to f factor in because oftentimes the folks on the ground, the worker bees I was referencing earlier, they tend to be the ones that are are, yes, this is part of my job to serve our students better, to make sure we're uh, addressing all their needs and, and bringing in students to the campus that are going to help uh, improve the, the, the experience for all, uh, but also paying attention to those students, what new students we're bringing in and what their needs will be. So oftentimes those worker bees see it. They're on the front lines every day. They're the ones who uh, can ha are probably the, the ones that get most excited and bought into what the campus is trying to do with internationalization. So I think what's ha what happens is you see uh, you can often see top-down support, top-level support for plan, for strategic plan as it develops. You can see the the folks on the ground doing the day-to-day, -day, see that, uh, see the real need and how they can make it happen uh, for their campus as in their or their part of the world. But you often see faculty potentially as roadblocks if they don't feel included in the process. Uh, department chairs, uh, individual faculty that, that tend to have a, a significant influence on campus, uh, those are the ones that, uh, or have the loud voices that uh, have the platforms to potentially muddy the waters uh, if they're if they don't if they feel they're not being included. So that's 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 certainly a real risk of uh, of strategic planning is and can differentiate a successful plan from. Um, from a, a very poor plan in the in terms of the implementation that might have very similar goals, have might very similar methods, but don't achieve the buy-in necessary to really drive them forward. And the second article is the, is the newer of the two uh, that came out on the 29th of September uh, by Lee Gardner, and it. And when you talk to this, this is in reference of working with university leaders uh, that uh, where you will see why one fails, why, and he brings in some great examples of why, why some fail, why uh, some succeed. Uh, he references two specific examples at University of Tulsa. Their 2017 strategic plan called for sweeping academic reorganization, cutting 40% of its programs, faculty vote, of, and that resulted in a faculty vote of no confidence from the president and provost. And that's a real danger if you don't have the faculty on board. Is you can your plans can very quickly devolve without uh, without inc including the right people uh, in the initial conversations before significant decisions are made. But some, on the other hand, there's uh, referencing uh, Kent Devereaux uh, when he started a strategic planning process uh, in 2020, um, about a year after he took over as president of Goucher uh, in Maryland, and he found this, uh, plan this strategic planning process invaluable. Uh, and and that's, that's something that most new presidents, when they take over, uh, they want to put their imprint on that institution and really drive, drive conversations forward about what's important to them. Uh, and changes of leadership often come with changes in direction. Uh, and this, uh, this was the piece. Uh, and the comment here that I think is so, so very important to this, this overall uh, and certainly impacts uh, international offices as well. And he, he, he found that process of strategic planning invaluable, but he made, makes the point, if you don't have a plan, the budget ends up becoming the plan. He says, with short-term financial considerations, this is uh, Devereaux talking from Goucher, and he says, short-term financial considerations, not the mission, shape the decisions. And that's so, so important to keep in mind is that um, when when you, if an institution starts a strategic planning process with this is our budget to make it happen, this is what we have to work with, not letting the uh, and letting that be the driving force rather than our mission is to internationalize. This is what we're going to do to get there. These this is the revenue that we'll be bringing in, but we're not letting that revenue projections or current current budgets current cycles coming current demographic trends uh, in terms of student populations drive decision making uh, it's really the mission that when when mission drives then everything comes together uh, and that that's not always but it more it's more likely to be successful if it's not a budget decision that's driving every 
uh, a budget outlook that's driving every decision as opposed to mission. We are committed as a university to do X, Y, and Z, and this is how we're going to do it. Uh, and budgets will fall in line as a result. Uh, but there's <laughs> this is uh, interesting. David Strauss is a, is, is a uh, principal of the Art and Science Group, a company that consults for colleges, uh, says there's a disturbing number of colleges, college and university strategic plans out there, in our view, that are neither strategic nor plans. And that's maybe, maybe more true than we, we would care to admit. And that they, they're, they're those that dis disavow the use of strategic plans as part of how do you run a university. But some are uh, see them as roadmaps, really, too, as, as the author uh, Lee Gardner um, indicates in this, roadmaps to transformation. And that, uh, that sometimes are dead ends bureaucratically. But it really, it, it, strategic plans are very much a part of our are the fabric of higher education in the United States. And the success or failure of those will depend on some on, on leadership, on uh, having the right people around the table and enough people around the table or just enough to people around the table and the folks to really implement successfully. So a great couple of articles and I think it's a great food for thought on, in terms of how we do what we do in international higher ed uh, and certainly more conversations on this to come, I'm sure. Next question, number two, will test optional impact graduate admissions? Now, we've all seen over the past couple of years with the pandemic, the, the kind of explosion of institutions that went test optional for undergraduate admissions. So not requiring SAT or ACT uh, for students to be admitted to institutions. Uh, this uh, was building on already a trend um, where at, at the time, uh, the pandemic hit, there were already over a thousand colleges that had gone test optional. Uh, we've seen now that in the past two years, uh, three quarters of uh, four-year institutions have gone uh, test optional in the United States. And that is something that um, many, uh, many insiders are seeing uh, outside of the most elite schools in the country uh, may be a fact that will, a fact of life that will continue beyond the pandemic, that we will retain a test optional or test blind as the University of California system has gone uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and this, is, uh, this has spurred some other conversations, certainly uh, at the undergraduate level, but at the graduate level as well for uh, graduate admission circles is, are the, are the kinds of exams we have been requiring still uh, relevant uh, in our graduate admissions processes, even though uh, many of these tests uh, that we've seen, we've seen the, uh, for on the international side, and we've seen the English proficiency exams, uh, IELTS, TOEFL, PTE Academic, and as well as Duolingo, which was always online uh, and could be taken from home. We've seen all of the all of the major four major providers have at-home editions of their exams that students could take uh, as part of their um, entrance requirements for English language proficiency to, uh, that institutions would have for international students. But you're also seeing, we saw that impact uh, ACT and SAT uh, takers in the past year. Uh, the majority of, uh, obviously, those that went test optional uh, put out their reports where they would say from their uh, admitted student classes for this fall uh, that they had huge increases in the number of students who were admitted without uh, submitting scores and enrolling without submitting scores. And then uh, those that admitted in 21 uh, for the fall of 21 are now uh, looking, or for the fall of 20 with test optional policies, are now looking at the data from uh, the students that enrolled this past year to see what their grade averages were, to come do a comparative study to pre-pandemic uh, uh, in intakes and, and, and academic performance to see if there really was a, a strong enough cor correlation or causation in terms of admitted students and their scores and their uh, academic performance in classroom. So that, that there's going to be more data on that in the coming year as well. But uh, what we're also seeing is we're seeing a, an explosion of graduate schools uh, and gra particularly graduate programs that had required the GRE or GMAT in the past, uh, starting to drop those as requirements for admissions to go test optional. Still taking them, but not expecting uh, that to, or using that as a determining factor whether to admit a student or not. And that has impacts for, for international students. Obviously, uh, at the graduate level, 
uh, English proficiencies uh, generally, in terms of entrance requirements, generally are a bit higher, uh, yet they're still required to take tests that are not designed for international students who have learned American English, who have not learned American English in a U.S. school in the United States. They're really designed for, uh, those tests are designed for a purpose purposefully American audiences. They'll say that they're, uh, they're, they have the way that their tests are written are more generic and more uh, in terms of their, their reach and scope and in terms of uh, uh, the, the questions that they're asking. And, uh, but you, you, you still have that, that initial challenge of are these adequate tests in teaching, uh, testing reasoning, test, testing vocabulary, testing these types of things for international students who have not learned the English that's being tested. Uh, so that's, um, there's probably in, in graduate admission circles less, uh, less uh, sympathy perhaps for that argument internationally that uh, the tests really aren't designed for them. But what the results have been, certainly during the pandemic, uh, the last year or two, we, we've seen colleges uh, recognize that until recently GRE, GMAT didn't have at-home additions either, uh, but the, there were test optional policies rolled out for graduate programs. Uh, some of those are persisting. Some are, have returned to, to normal uh, in terms of if they were giving test optional exemptions because of the pandemic, they're now going back into place because um, slowly more test centers are available. The at-home edition works for some of them. Uh, but you have really competitive institutions uh, for admissions like UC Berkeley, uh, where uh, they have 125 uh, graduate programs. At present, new this fall, or for next fall, only 13 of those 125 are going to require GRE for admissions next year. And this is uh, the, the most departments at Berkeley were eliminating, uh, this from an inside higher ed story, were eliminating GRE requirements due to difficult, the difficulties applicants had in taking the exam during the pandemic. Uh, that was during the pandemic, but the majority of Berkeley departments this year again chose not to require the GRE. So the, in the past, the GRE has been something that uh, these departments had leaned on heavily. Uh, is uh, that significant? It's very significant to make this decision now to be, go, be going test optional at the graduate level. So it's, uh, there are still a fair few that are out there. Uh, and that is uh, the FAIR, FAIR test, the National Center for FAIR, test, FAIR and Open Testing uh, has been leading the campaign obviously at the undergraduate level and are uh, also opposed to, to uh, the GRE as a requirement for admission. That there are now a list of more than 400 STEM programs that do not require the GRE. It's been growing and the FAIR test organization has been tracking that as well, including programs at Harvard, Yale, and Stanford, uh, and now the Berkeley ones. So there's a sig significant uh, 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 embracing of this uh, test optional movement, uh, not only at the undergrad level, but increasingly at the graduate level. So. Uh, uh, where hopefully that that trend will co will continue. Obviously, the testing community is uh, is, is pushing back on this idea. Uh, uh, an associate VP at uh, ETS has said that this is a, a mistake to drop the GRE at Berkeley, and he's uh, probably feeling the same thing that they felt uh, when California Board of Regents decided to go test blind. Uh, and the impact that was going to have on SAT test takers. So uh, his claim uh, at uh, ETS is that when standard is, standardized testing is removed from the admissions process of graduate and professional programs, the other subjective components of an application packet wield even greater influence. Well, of course. And uh, from the potential for great inflation to the connections needed to obtain strong recommendation letters to access and opportunity for research opportunities, uh, candidates from underrepresented backgrounds are, are disadvantaged. disadvantaged. And that's a questionable statement to, to make, uh, frankly, uh, when you've seen uh, admissions uh, at the undergraduate level, you've certainly seen the diversity of admitted students uh, at all levels uh, from um, four-year uh, state institutions to four-year privates, the most selective privates, the diversity uh, of admitted students uh, increased dramatically and as a result at the majority of campuses uh, who went test optional. So I think there's, um, they obviously at, at ETS have vested interest in uh, staying uh, uh, t test required or, uh, and this is another uh, kind of uh, 
dagger in, into the carcass of, uh, of the test organization industry. So we'll see where it goes, uh, if this is going to have legs beyond Berkeley and other graduate programs that have already jumped on board. And it's interesting that that process is starting with some of the most selective programs in the country, the selective institutions in the country, whereas maybe with uh, undergraduate admissions you, tend, you tended to have uh, obviously, community colleges never required SAT or ACT, but you began seeing four-year state institutions going test optional if there weren't already state requirements to, to do it, as we saw in Florida, uh, to have uh, to require testing for uh, for scholarship consideration. So it's really going to be interesting to see how this develops uh, uh, at the graduate level as well as what's been going on at the undergrad level. So stay tuned to that, that one for more. Now the final question of the day, can internationalization be mandated by governments? Internationalization of institutions, colleges and universities. Um, there are two perspectives on this that I'll, I'll share, both from Pi News articles this past week, that raise the level of discussion uh, and government's role in internationalization uh, that you see uh, from the U.S. we are, we are probably uh, of the major sending countries, certainly it can be said fairly confidently that the U.S. has the least, uh, and also talking about strategic plans, the least comprehensive engagement of U.S. government level uh, departments in uh, organizing uh, national education, international education policy, and as a result, the expectations uh, are certainly on the institutional level in the U.S. You're and will never be because of our nature as a country, very decentralized, very independent-minded, uh, and particularly in higher education circles where there isn't a direct oversight other than financial aid uh, concerns um, in managing U.S. higher education. Uh, you see issues uh, that uh, in other countries are government mandated in terms of you're going to do this, you're going to do that when it comes to uh, internationalization. Uh, in the U.S., we're probably on the furthest scale, uh, on the far end of the scale, at least in terms of the major uh, receiving countries, uh, in terms of government involvement in, in internationalization efforts. Uh, maybe we're, that's going to be changing, uh, not certainly in terms of requiring or mandating, as one of the, one of the countries we're going to be talking about has, but you certainly see those, uh, the not resistance, but certainly in the non-existence of, uh, of, of, of government control over U.S. higher education and when it comes to internationalization. There are policies that they make that inter impact our ability to internationalize, but certainly um, it's not a, it's not, those aren't mandated government policies that are specifically targeting internationalization. Where we have two countries, the U uh, in the U.K., We've talked about how the government has helped uh, develop the, uh, kind of a national strategy for international ed, uh, has been working with Universities UK and other uh, higher ed associations specifically on, on the components of that strategy. You now, uh, you now have uh, Universities UK calling on the uh, UK government to help their institutions achieve global ambitions. Uh, helping them to internationalize in terms of uh, their transnational education efforts, in terms of their ability to bring students in related to visa policies, post-study work, all of that is uh, are intimately connected in terms of uh, how how these uh, how the pieces fit together in the UK. Uh, so there's there's a desire for support from the UK government. From the U, from the U, UK university side and their and their member member bodies, uh, so there's uh, uh, this is really something that uh, that is important I think to keep in mind is uh, the, the control the level of government influence and ability to change uh, the uh, internationalization efforts is something we all need to be aware of uh, in our daily lives. The, uh, the one side of the other side of the arguments uh, is uh, we're seeing the beginnings of in South Africa uh, that uh, so the South African government is now rethinking uh, international higher education according to the president of the country's leading international ed association uh, while uh, that they are rethinking their uh, how they do international ed uh, and that's uh, the what part of the one of the themes of that is that the the government uh, is now um, South Af Africa's policy framework 
on internationalization of education uh, that was launched in November 2020 is now expected to help guide universities on how to attract international students and assess and, ass and assert the country's position as Africa's main destination for external students. It's going to, and the the thought is this kind of leadership from the government level providing that framework and the. Uh, the ability for uh, institutions to internationalize, uh, this is really uh, uh, is a significant piece uh, of this. Uh, it's not just internationalize, internationalize uh, by, by the government. It's actually um, the providing the support and the framework through which inter institutions can internationalize. And uh, in interestingly, this, 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 point, this article points out that uni universities now have a framework uh, to uh, guide them on what to do and what not to do, and we'll be working with them to implement it, and, and that has been another plus for them. Uh, but this framework that the government put out now requires, for the first time, to develop and have internationalization policies, plans, and strategies for internationalization. So that is now something all institutions in South Africa, higher education institutions, must do. So it'll be interesting to see how this uh, how this takes flight in South Africa, and uh, we'll look at that as uh, as a potential other countries that are looking to become destination markets for international students and further internationalize their higher education institutions. We'll be looking at South Africa to see how uh, this goes in terms of the government top down approach uh, for. Uh, providing the, a positive framework for those institutions that are looking to internationalize, but also m mandating that they all develop these kinds of plans. So we'll be keeping an eye on those, uh, that, those stories that we've covered this week uh, as they develop, but certainly wanted to give you some food for thought for the coming uh, weeks and months ahead as we en uh, enter into the final quarter of 2021. So until next time, uh, we look forward to chatting with you again, and until then, have a wonderful week. Cheers.